So as of this morning, we now have a date for the start of what is possibly the highest stakes trial in history. Donald J. Trump's criminal trial for trying to steal the election. Is, it's going to start on March 4th, which is also the day before Super Tuesday. This means the Republican frontrunner will not be rallying supporters at MAGA rallies on the day before 15 states vote. Instead, he will be sitting in a federal courtroom in D.C. So for a guy who spent the majority of his life controlling the narrative and almost always getting away with things like, say, joking about grabbing women or asking Russia to find Hillary Clinton's emails in 2016, Donald Trump has never faced criminal consequences or real accountability. He doesn't even expect to. I mean, remember he joked about how his supporters would still like him even if he shot someone in the middle of Manhattan? But that seems like it is changing. The ex-president wanted a trial date in 2026, and today he got one, two years earlier, in 2024. Federal Judge Tanya, Tanya Chutkin flatly rejected his attorney's plea in court this morning. Judge Chutkin repeatedly asked Attorney John Laura to come up with a compromise trial date. The Trump lawyer refused. So Judge Chutkin set one just two months after what the special counsel's office requested. Trump seems to have lost control. His entire life has been stagecrafted. But this time, he's not the one in charge of producing the show. Joining once again are two veteran federal prosecutors. Thank you for sticking with me, Mary and Shan. So I want to start just with how firm this March 4th date is. As people are circling on their calendar, Trump has said he wants to appeal that date. He can't do that. Could it still change? It could still change. I mean, it wasn't just the trial date that Judge Chutkin set. She set all kinds of interim dates, the dates for pretrial motions, the dates for the government to turn over its witness list, the dates for it to uh, turn over its exhibits. So there's a whole bunch of, of interim dates on the schedule. There could be legitimate reasons either on behalf of Mr. Trump or the government mm. for one or two of those dates to slip by a day or two of factual or legal reasons that that bring them into court to ask for it to slip. There could be reasons for that date of March 4th to slip for a day or two or even a week or two. But it's not going to slip to pass the election. Mm -hmm. This this is going to happen. It's going to happen before the election. I think it's going to happen before the convention. Um, but but people shouldn't be, you know, alarmed if something happens and there's a day here. Or if it's day. March 7th or 8th. It's yeah, like, right, it's okay. exactly. <laughs> so, Shannon, I, one of the references, he, he, can't, he can't actually appeal the date, but he can delay it. His lawyers can through pretrial motions, and Mary was referencing these. What do some of those look like, or what are some of the examples of what they could try to do? Well, I think he will have some issues with genuine and scheduling mm -hmm. issues. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, they might have conflicting other appearance dates in the other cases. Uh, he might actually be scheduled for a campaign appearance, which she's not going to give him a magic bullet for. Well, so th let me just stop you there just for a second. Sorry to interrupt you, but if he has a campaign rally, is that a good enough reason to delay a trial? Uh, probably not, but it could delay things leading up to the trial. And that's the key for him, is to try and make some of those deadlines get delayed so that it might cause the actual trial date to move a bit. All else failing, you know, it might be a good time for him to pull a muscle suddenly so he can't get there that day. <laughs> pull a muscle or schedule a lot of rallies. Right. So as, whenever the date starts, mm -hmm. how long should we expect? You don't know the exact amount, but what's the scope of the amount of time that this kind of a trial could take? I think the government has said four to six weeks. And, you know, that's even on that's because they've taken a look at what witnesses they expect to call, what exhibits they expect to introduce. They've made an estimate about cross-examination time for each one of those witnesses. But even that is a, an estimate based on the state of affairs now. There could be more people cooperating by then. Mm -hmm. There could be some uh, legal rulings that change what evidence is admissible and what is not. So there's all kinds of things that could affect that. But I do think we're looking at it at least least probably a month long trial. And if we count, also jury selection is going to take time, mm -hmm. right? They're going to have to have questionnaires to make sure people can be fair and unbiased and haven't, don't have pre, hasn't, haven't prejudged the case. That can take a while in a case like that. And this. that could make it take a little bit longer. Right. So they will already have done those jury questionnaires before March 4th, mm -hmm. and they're hoping to actually swear the jury on more, March 4th. But if they have a hard time getting enough people, um, you know, that could that could push off a little bit. I, I would disagree with Shan, though, that the, that the judge is going to, you know, give him a pass for things like campaign rallies. I <laughs> yeah, think she was pretty clear today. That seems like today. it's a bit of a give. <laughs> yeah, but. I think she was pretty clear today. People have jobs, and when you're a criminal defendant, you know, that's so, part of your job. Yeah, But he so, might miss the plane. 
He, he might have missed a plane. Oh, don't give him ideas. Okay, so also Shen says... He has his own plane. <laughs> he does. He can't really miss it. Judge Chuck says she's, quote, watching carefully for anything that might affect or poison the jury pool. This really stuck out to me today. She says that if Laura intends to poll D.C. residents as part of a change of venue, menu motion, he must inform the court. What does that mean, and kind of what might she do? What does she mean by that? Yeah, that's really the big looming question here, uh, is how do you interpret all the stuff he says as trying to poison the jury pool? And there's a very... In a normal case, all of it would be tainting the jury Mm -hmm. pool. And here, she's trying to fairly balance the idea of you got to let him campaign, he has a right to say, you know, I'm innocent, etc. That's... If he keeps going really over the line with that... DOJ will be forced to bring that to the judge's attention. The judge will have to rule on it. I don't think she'll be shy about ruling on that. I'm sure she'll give him a couple of passes with stern warnings. But I don't think that DOJ is very chomping at the bit to want to bring that Absolutely. because they're so worried about being hit on the First Amendment concerns. Yeah. They're also worried it'll look like it's political persecution, mm-hmm. which is what he's running on right now. So there, uh, Judge Chuck, and I mean, many people described her as not messing around. Like, there's lots of ways to describe her. But watching the ruling this morning and how she's behaved to date, what is your take? What do you read from it on how she's going to operate this trial? Well, I mean, she is committed to treating him like any other criminal defendant. Now, he's already not being treated exactly like any other criminal defendant, but she wants to do so as much as possible. And I think what she, you know, did today, like, Judge Chuckin was a was a criminal defense attorney. She has defended cases and prepared for trial herself many, many times in her careers, never defending somebody like Mr. Trump, but, you know, defending uh, complicated criminal cases. So she's able to really assess how long will it take in a case like this to get ready. And I think she's bringing all of her experience, both as a criminal defense attorney and a, and as a judge, to bring here and try to give him, if well, not try, she will give him a fair trial try to respect his rights to due process, but not let him run the show. The campaign messages from Republican candidates for president in 2024 are pretty full of darkness, division, and a big sense of foreboding about the future of the country. That stands in stark contrast to what we've been hearing from President Biden's campaign for re-election. They made that point with a huge, that's huge for this period of time, $25 million ad buy the week of the Republican debate to send a different message, including about how the United States has come back since the pandemic. In small towns and big cities, we're coming back stronger than ever. Manufacturing jobs are coming home. High-speed computer chips are getting made right here. America is leading the world in clean energy. There are some who say America is failing, not Joe Biden. He believes our best days are ahead because he believes in the American people. Those who bet against America are learning how wrong they are. It's never, ever been a good bet to bet against America. Never. Julie Chavez Rodriguez is the campaign manager for President Biden's re-election campaign. Previously, she was a senior advisor to President Biden and was also a special assistant to President Obama. And she joins me now. First of all, I'm so grateful you are here. You are running a campaign, which, by the way, is a very busy job. And you're moving to Delaware. So thank you for being here with me tonight. So I wanted to start just with some of the news we learned today. Um, And you're a very savvy political operator. Obviously, you're running a campaign I just want to get your reaction to the prospect of a criminal trial starting on the day before Super Tuesday. Well, look, Jen, thank you, one, for so much for having me this evening. And it's just, you know, I think we've seen such incredible support. And, you know, I I definitely understand that those are matters that will continue to play out in the courts and and obviously, you know, for their campaigns to contend with. But what we're we're really focused on is just making sure that the American people really know um, what President Biden has done, um, what Vice President Biden has done to be able to support um, the American voter, what they're doing to lower drug prices, to lower costs for families, and to make sure, as you saw in the ad that you just showed, that, you know, we're really reminding folks that America is back and that this president and vice president have made a tremendous investment, um, not just in the country, but in our people. I know you were probably watching the Republican debate last week, Um, even as you are, of course, um, talking about and and portraying to the American people all the things President Biden has done. 
What stuck out to you from that debate as you were watching it? What, what, what was a moment that stuck out to you? Well, you know, I think for me, it was really seeing that it was a consistent sort of um, race to a real extreme agenda. Um, what we saw on stage were was maybe not necessarily certain candidates, but definitely their agenda and their policies were front and center. And it was a real extreme conversation about, um, you know, banning abortion and having a national ban on abortion. Um, being able to, you know, take um, different approaches to, to, you know, addressing such critical issues. It wasn't about real solutions for um, the American people. And that's what we're really focused on, is making sure that we're communicating that contrast. And what we saw on the debate stage, again, was a real race towards um, this extreme agenda that we've continued to see from so many of um, the GOP primary candidates right now. And, and it's out of touch with the American voter. It's so extreme, and um, we know that, you know, that's something that's not um, a real winning agenda or a, um, you know, winning sort of campaign. Well, I know you guys did an ad on abortion um, after the the debate last week. And it's always telling where, where campaigns spend money, right, because it's where you're, it sticks out in your mind and where you think you can have the biggest impact. How do you combat this argument, which also drives me insane, that many of these Republican candidates are making, that Democratic candidates want to they support more uh, abortions in a third trimester they support abortion till 40 weeks till birth it's just not accurate and i think you know what it, do you wish people what do you wish can't people were saying out there well you know i wish that people really understood um that you know the president and the vice president are focused on restoring fundamental freedoms for the american people what we saw in the dobbs decision was i think a real eye-opener for so many um, women across this country for so many families across this country we're all of a sudden, um, you know, today in America, uh, you know, my younger niece has less rights than I do. And that's what, um, you know, people are really starting to see and understand about how just extreme their agenda is. And what the president and vice president are focused on is restoring Roe v. Wade and ensuring that that becomes the law of the land, um, because that's an important, you know, um, that's an important sort of right that we have um, fought for and, and we need to continue to fight for. One of the moments that stood out to me in that debate was when the majority of candidates raised their hand and said they would support Donald Trump even if he was convicted mm -hmm. of a crime. Uh, now, I know you're focused on a positive, proactive agenda that the president is implementing, which is hugely important, what impacts the American public. But what was going through your head in that moment? Well, you know, I think it just shows that um, all of them are really, you know, trying to take the more extreme position and um, really trying to sort of take that, you know, race for the MAGA base and take, uh, again, sort of just extreme positions that are out of touch with voters. Um, I mean, by saying that climate change is a hoax is one example. Um, so it's just absolutely out of touch um, with the reality that we're facing as a nation and that we're facing as a, as a world. So I think, you know, um, we want to continue to just make sure that we are really showing um, how extreme those positions are and that they're, you know, all sort of coming from um, the same kind of policy agenda that we saw um, continue to lose in election after election. I think one thing for us that's really exciting, in addition to seeing the kind of enthusiasm for our campaign, is knowing it, that in the last 38 special elections, Democrats have outperformed um, by 10 percent. And that's something that we're going to continue to grow and continue to build on. That's that's an important statistic. I don't think a lot of people know. Now, there are a lot of backseat drivers um, when it comes to running political campaigns. I don't have to tell you, you're probably living that. I know that from working in the White House. And what do you say to Democrats who say the president and the campaign, they should all be talking about Trump's legal issues and these criminal indictments much more. And it's a missed opportunity. Well, you know, I think the president, um, when he ran for office in the first place, um, was really, you know, adamant about ensuring that the um, Justice Department was an independent, um, you know, department and that they were able to execute effectively in the ways that they needed to. And so, um, you know, we're going to continue to ensure that the Justice Department has the ability to do their job. And what we're going to continue to focus on is just, again, the, um, you know, accomplishments that this president and vice president have have achieved, thanks to, again, incredible legislation that we've been able to pass, but also the choice that's before voters right now and really what's at stake in this election. And, you know, when we're dealing with a Republican field um, that is scapegoating immigrants, that's talking about banning books, that, again, continues to focus on a national abortion ban, we just know that those are out of touch with um, so many voters across this country.
So every campaign looks different because uh, they're happening in different moments in time and you're trying to win, to state the obvious. What should people expect about how this campaign will be different from uh, President Biden's election campaign uh, back in 2020? Well, we're really excited to be able to be headquartered in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, as you know, many folks know, it's just it really is um, a home for President Biden. It's where he's raised his family. It, and it really reflects so many of the core values that are true to who he is when it comes to faith and family and hard work. And so being able to be in a city um, that really exudes those values is one that's really exciting. Um, but also the partnership that we have with the DNC. I think that that really is a new playbook that we're writing. Um, and one that we're continuing to build upon because we know that, um, you know, we need to not just elect President Biden and Vice President Harris, but we need to continue to elect Democrats up and down the ballot. And we know that um, that kind of partnership is a real winning strategy for us right now. Julie Chavez Rodriguez running the presidential campaign. Not an easy job. Thank you so much for coming in, for joining me tonight. Good luck with your move to Wilmington. We'll look forward to getting updates in the in the future.